I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me on, Sean. Especially I've I've been listening to your podcast for years. So when you asked, I was like, yes. Like, I'm, well, I'm Pete. No, I think you know what? I mean, you invited uh, you invited me on your podcast and it's a great show. I've been listening to a few episodes. I didn't know your podcast before you invited me on. Um and and I've I've been digging through some episodes. Oh, I had a long drive uh, a couple of weeks ago and I I listened to two or three of them and it's a, it's a really great show. How did you come to starting the podcast? Um to be honest, it was my own I wanted to investigate certain issues um, and just get involved with discussions because I suppose a few years ago, it, it seemed to be that you had like the academics and the coaches and they're kind of at each other's throats. And it really didn't really make sense to me at all. Like uh, each has their own specific skills. And if you came together and just discuss things, you can come up with some really good ideas and that's the only way we can, we can progress. So mm -hmm. I don't know where this idea of, you know, this, I, it wasn't really a Twitter war, but, you know, I'd see snarky comments and I was like, well, I don't really like that. Uh, I actually want to meet and, um, you know, if I'm reading a paper and I find it fascinating, I want to try and see if I could speak to the person that wrote it. Because, um, I don't know, I guess the topic that, even though I wasn't necessarily investigating it loads, a lot of around uh, asymmetry, mm. you had loads of coaches saying, um, oh, you know, it it wasn't it's not that worthwhile looking into etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, why is there so much research focus in this area at the time and like i knew some of the researchers that had gone into a lot of detail with their research on asymmetry mm. and their stance in it wasn't as clear cut it was very much that it may be worthwhile looking into it may be not in certain situations but the way that other people would talk about it would be that this person's you know fill in with this type of uh, assessment it's not worth it and it's like there's a disconnect here so that was kind of one of the reasons I wanted to start the podcast and I just lent it towards topics that I enjoyed and um, questions that were coming up in I don't know the training community which I found interesting so it led me to think of like you know every time I do a season a different topic and uh, I obviously had the recent one on on hybrid training uh, or concurrent training whatever you like to call it Mm. Uh, and that's why I got in contact with you because I like the stuff that you were doing. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's led on from that. And I, I, I want to I want to write. I want to write books on some ideas. Uh, so I'm hoping that the podcast leads to more writing. So, yeah, yeah that's why I started it. That's that's a I think it's a great reason to start a podcast. And I think the intention behind what you did is is fantastic because at a, at a time where there's so many people going against you know, each other or ideas or whatnot, trying to blend ideas and bring them together and see, you know, whether, whether two meet when you have two ideas, whether they're opposing, whether they're parallel, if you could just find where they actually connect. Now you have a new point uh, in your, in your network, in your map. And then from there, you might, you know, go a different direction that you wouldn't have thought of before. Yeah. It opens up new questions every time you come to either agreement or a disagreement. It opens up new questions, and that's the exciting thing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's it's really led me to question everything that I do. Like I obviously during my PhD, I learned a lot of uh, academic skills uh, and the ability, I think, to really realize that I do not know everything. Yeah, which is I'd... a very humbling feeling and a very exciting feeling because it's just led me to like, well, I don't know everything. Let's keep looking <laughs> and I'll never stop, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's just applying those skills in a different medium, I guess. Yeah, and do you find that? And that's what I found with with my podcast. The more episodes you do, the more you become very comfortable with knowing that you're very limited in your scope and what you actually understand and because you go so far to the, maybe the outskirts, because you're, we're looking for experts. We're trying to talk to the people who, like you said, wrote the paper, wrote the book, trained so-and-so. Uh, so, so we're, uh, the more you go, the more you realize how infinitely vast the, the scope of knowledge actually is. Mm -hmm. And that there's no point just trying to, or there is a point trying to connect it all. There's no point trying to understand it all at once. And there's definitely no point being very, too confident about, how much you know or 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 the 
maybe the validity of what you mm -hmm. what you think you understand yeah well i guess it's the confidence in what you know sometimes seems to sell more on social media so people lean into that uh rather than in those nuances and that's where podcasting is so great because you kind of get those nuances and discussions especially when you go off tangent and that's where you start to really get where someone's coming from with their opinion i think um they come up with some crazy tangent story behind their thinking and it sort of exposes how they think which i think is really important so if they've got an opinion how do they get there uh, and you don't get that all the time with the written word that's why i think why i wanted to write and do podcasts is because mm -hmm. you get that balance between the two yeah you do and it's it's definitely a different skill and some people are really good at writing and they can really catch you with you know a few characters and then you know i'm talking about twitter here where you have some very skilled folks that you know they know how to catch attention they know how to write a good tweet they know how to write a good thread and I, I've, I've actually been surprised because I, I didn't spend much time on Twitter before, but about a year, a year, a year and a half ago, I started just searching for information there and asking questions. And the amount of, uh, you know, experts each in their own field that are just ready to answer questions. And obviously it's easy, quote unquote, because the expert wants to show that they know. So obviously they're going to try and give the best answer possible. But for people looking for answers, it's a fantastic platform. And then you can have an aggregate it's almost instantaneously of all those experts coming together and telling you what they think about a given topic. And the, the speed at which you can you know, move forward in understanding any given topic is, is fascinating. Mm. Do you find the same thing? Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I sort of went off Twitter because it seemed like a very volatile landscape. Uh, and then recently got back into Twitter because I just I focus on the key people that I want to follow. And my Twitter is now just a selection of bookmarks. Um, originally it was because I, uh, wanted to learn more coding. So mm. there was all sorts of threads around, you know, there's a free course here, try this, try that. So I've just got these, these bookmarks of different, uh, coding websites. I haven't had a chance to actually utilize them all at the moment, but I've got them there for when I have a bit of time, maybe over Christmas. Uh, and then the more I did that, the more I started following your lines of thread and, you know, questions that you ask and you can see the re Applies from like Gordo Byrne, mm. Alan Cousins, uh, mm. Elias, uh, Latonin. Is it Latonin? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it's just like, yeah, it's, there's fountains of knowledge here. So I've just got a lot of bookmarks and I, I review them all the time. Um, yeah. So it's a nice little balance between coding and I guess because I come from a biomechanics background and I, you know, I went with concurrent training, I have to develop my physiological side a bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, they, my bookmarks tend to be on that side because that's where I feel I'm most weakest. But um, yeah, it's just a nice resource that you can just develop for yourself. Yeah, that's. Do you, do you have a process for going through notes? It's actually something I've, I was working on just before we got on the podcast. I found this app yesterday called Notion, and okay. somebody recommended it on Twitter as well. And it's just kind of a, a blend between Evernote and Trello and and databases that you can link together as well to try and be more i need to be more coherent in my note taking i need mm -hmm. to link notes to projects i need to not only bookmark but i need to review my bookmarks do you, do you have a process to go back and oh you've arch archived this post or you've tagged this post save this post for later do you go back and read them all and if so how do you do I, I think my process could be greatly improved if i'm honest um so if i've got everything saved from bookmarks and twitter i keep all my papers in zotero um, and then I use sort of like notes on my iPad and usually I'm just sort of scribbling, cranking my maps because I'm trying to join things together. Uh, but with my, with my notes app, like I've got like separate sheets for, I, I try and if I feel really overwhelmed with a lot of information that's coming in, that could be just work. It could be like ideas with science, whatever it could be. Um, I try and spend half an hour where I just write everything that's in my head. Mm -hmm. So all of these more scientific -y, um, uh, mind maps are kind of mixed in with a load of other random stuff that I've got. So it's a bit disorganized, but it's great flicking back as to like, you know, I, I like to think of it. If I'm a little bit organized with it, it kind of tells a story of where I was at when writing it. Um, but then going back, it just feels a bit unorganized. So, yeah, maybe I'll check out Notion because I probably need something a little bit better. 
um, just to tidy it up, you know? Yeah, uh, let's, let's, let's zoom out a bit. What's your, what's your process? How do you pick what projects you want to work on? If it's uh, a, a, an article you want to write, if it's a video you want to shoot, a podcast you want to record, what's your process uh, of one, choosing which one to go for, you know, in priority? And two, then how do you think about those different projects and work through them? Hmm. Uh, in terms of linking to the podcast, I guess the overarching aim is to, okay, what do I want to investigate? Because I'm going to enjoy writing about it. Uh, not only from a scientific view, view, but from like a storytelling view as well. Um, so <clears throat> the reason I got towards looking at hybrid training and current training within the recent uh, series of uh, the progress theory is because I was seeing a lot of coaches talk about oh the interference effect is doesn't exist look at crossfit it's a perfect example of where it doesn't exist um so i'm assuming that people were saying that oh you can't train uh, strength and endurance together but maybe it was just the people i follow i wasn't actually seeing that but i have heard of people saying like there's this idea that you know there's a marathon runner and they put them next to a picture of like Dwayne Chambers sprinting or something like that you know they're completely different so you can't train strength and endurance together and it's like something's something's not adding up here mm. it doesn't doesn't match uh, because you know the feats that um cross the athletes were doing in the games like the quality of the games athletes has risen exponentially hasn't it if you look yeah. back to like 2010 technically <laughs> in sport terms that's not that long ago but they're incredible athletes now. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, back then it was always oh, cool to make fun of someone doing a dodgy deadlift or something. Now they're just incredible, incredible athletes. So it's like, well, okay. It felt like the research was behind what was happening or what we were seeing in the community. Yeah. So I was like something I, I want to investigate that. And uh, I, I, you know, I've had four knee surgeries. I didn't just want to train in one sport. I wanted to try things because I enjoy going to the gym, but also like going outside. How can I match the two? Um, how can I develop an idea, not a sport, but just a way of training life that I could do? And then I am kind of ready to do any, if someone goes, oh, Phil, do you want to do a half marathon tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. Won't get a great time, but I'd have some kind of capacity that I could mm. actually do it. Mm. So that's why I wanted to investigate this. So it was from a scientific curiosity point, you know, is the research behind uh, what coaches and scientists, you know, if they are disagreeing on certain points, like, why is that? Um, and just a way of, okay, I wanted to tell stories about how people train because I found it fascinating that people are trying different things. Um, so that's what led me towards towards this idea of hybrid training. Um, so it ended up with the, the goal of the book. I wanted mm -hmm. to write a goal, uh, write a book on this topic. So it kind of led to there. So the next idea for a book i guess yeah it's going to depend usually on what i find absolutely fascinating and it's probably what i see uh, great athletes doing you know maybe you know how can someone how can people be so good at uh, in very extreme altitudes or you know how can people how can uh, deep sea divers be able to tolerate that much pressure i don't know these questions so i want to find them out so that mm. yeah so i try and link it to the to the podcast yeah, it's I, I guess it's the best way to operate. At least I, I mean I'm I'm very much the same way as you are just following your own interests and kind of scratching your own itch. And that seems to it's it seems to resonate with, you know, some people. Not everybody, but I mean, you know, the goal should never be to, you know, please everybody or reach everybody. Mm -hmm. But if you if you can find a topic, a question that you want answered and then pursue that, um, First of all, you'll have fun doing it. And then second of all, a lot of people will probably get a lot of value out of it because it's your unique perspective. It's Did you ever ask yourself, well, other people have done it before. Um, it's just going to be redundant. Why am I doing this? Or did you never actually think about that? I don't know if I ever thought about that. Um, so like I do some stuff with the guys from Omnia Performance, um, mm -hmm. with Focus Crawley and that. Uh, and um, even with those that probably have a lot of similarities, I never saw them as like this competition. I just saw it as an opportunity to learn off them. 
Mm-hmm. And then you end up like collaborating with them, which I think was the original aim of the podcast. It was never to like, I'm going to be the best, put everyone else down so I could be on top. It was just, it was just an opportunity to explore. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And I guess even though the question probably has been answered and is been answered in different ways, I'd thought, well, you can't just have one opinion. Um, I don't, you know, I don't want just one opinion out there. And if that one opinion's mine, I think something's wrong. So I feel like I'm contributing to the area. Mm. So yeah, I guess it hasn't really, um, hasn't really affected uh, my idea of I won't go down that route because I think it's been done to death. Um, if it has been done to death, it probably means that I'm not interested in it. So I mm. never really think about it. So, <laughs> it's it's either either way. I think it's the right way to go into things uh, because I mean I know personally when I you know started out communicating online, um, you follow all those coaches. I mean I used to, I follow all those coaches, and it seems like every been everything's been done, everything's been said, and you ask yourself why would I why would I contribute to the noise if it's already been like, I mean I've read it from ten different people. What's what difference is it going to be? But I think we do each bring our own unique perspective and blend of different interests uh, and, and, and backgrounds. And that makes every topic very, very unique when somebody's ready to, you know, to share it and is, is good at, at doing so. Do you, I guess we, we can dive now into, into hybrid training. Cause that was one of the, the main topics I want to talk about with you. Um, so you were interested in maybe the scientific validity or, uh, whether or not it made sense to talk about that infer- interference effect. W- was there a limitation between strength training, endurance training? Uh, well, talk, talk to us about the maybe the first steps that you took in that world. What was it? What direction did you take at first? Hmm. So I guess <clears throat> first uh, I started to reach out to people that had investigated concurrent training. So I wanted to look at the intervention studies to get an overview between, okay, which studies have said uh, that there was a difference between, say, a strength-only group and then a group that did strength and hypertrophy, um, and those that said there wasn't a difference between the two. So, you know, if you look into the literature, some have found that two groups improve whatever performance measure, whatever measure it might have been, they found it they've been exactly the same. Some have found there's a difference between um, the combined group and the strength only group. So by doing that, I want to then go into the methods to try and understand, okay, what kind of difference in, in, in the interventions I think may have contributed to that. Um, and in doing so, like I spoke to um, Dr. Matt Lee uh, over in Australia, uh, and he definitely opened up some interesting uh, topics as to, all the different variables that are involved when it comes to when you're combining groups because it's those little tweaks that could actually have a big impact on whether there's an interference effect or none or a very minimized one Uh, and through that you know led me to certain papers which then uh, led me towards what I believe to be the first study which looked at the interference effects or actually better better way to coin that is that he's the first person that used interference in his interpretation of what he was finding. So you've got the Professor Robert Hickson paper. Mm. I know that Professor Keith Barr talks a lot about it um, in some of his work where Professor Hickson was working with Professor Halosi, who was a a very um, well-respected physiologist uh, in endurance research. Uh, And then he would, to impress Professor Halosi, would join him on his afternoon run bearing in mind that Professor Hickson was a, was a power lifter. Mm. So the idea was he was adding in these runs to impress his boss while still trying to train as a power lifter. And what he was finding was that all of a sudden he was starting to notice changes in his shape, changes in his strength, in his power lifting. And he attributed it to this running training that he was doing with his boss. So when he mentioned it to Professor Halosi, he said, Professor Halosi said, well, when you get your own lab, that should be your first study. And it was. Back in 1980, it was released. Uh, so you get to see, you know, if you've got three groups, you've got strength only, uh, endurance only, and then strength and endurance together, a combined group. Uh, and what he found that 
for the uh, endurance measures, they weren't really affected in terms of the difference between the groups. They were pretty much equal. Mm. Whereas uh, strength increased each week, same as the combined group, same as the strength group. But once it reached week seven, they started to plateau and started to decrease by week 11, which the um, strength only group didn't do. So he was starting to think, well, clearly something happened towards the end of the intervention, which I believe uh, was causing this interference and led to the strength to start to decrease ultimately. Um, And they attributed it to the endurance training. So I think that's where a lot of the research went after that. There were, there was this notion that strength training affects, no, endurance training affects strength training. What is it about endurance training that affects strength training? Rather than, well, maybe if we change things a bit, we might be able to minimize that difference that we were seeing. But I think that happened later on, you know, after, you know, maybe a decade or two of investigating exactly what they think endurance training does to try and affect strength training. After that, they were starting to realize through an intervention studies that maybe this relationship isn't as strong as we first thought. So now in my storytelling mind, I'm starting to say, OK, I'm starting to get this idea of where people thought, you know, there was uh, an interference effect. Endurance training negatively uh, impacts your strength training and how through research and what we were seeing in CrossFit or whatever type of hybrid type sport, we're starting to see changes in people's perception about how uh, how this interference effect can actually negatively impact your concurrent training. So uh, it, it led to like a nice story, which is obviously great if I want to write a book about it. Um, so hopefully I've you know tried to detail, okay, what are the things that they thought would contribute to this interference effect uh, and think about how that how these factors could be manipulated by certain training variables what was your hunch going into it did you have an an idea where you did you stand on one side or the other in terms of is there an effect how big is the effect if so in which direction i didn't say i, I had a hunch i just got a little bit confused initially because Whenever people co- talk about the interference effect, they seem to link it to one factor. And what I was seeing through all of the intervention type studies was that it's likely to be a number of different factors and maybe different factors influence different components of strength training more than others. Um, so if you look at the, um, particularly of any recent meta-analysis, it seems that explosive strength seems to be the one that is most susceptible to any interference effect in comparison mm. to hypertrophy or strength. So you've got to think, okay, what might be, what factors might be linked to um, making explosive strength be more susceptible than the others? Um, and then I thought back to, you know, back to university where you, you, you've investigated this stuff in lectures and you hear about this, like, what the hell is mTOR? And what the hell is AMPK? Uh, and that seems to be people's go-to. It's like, yeah, that's the reason. And the more I looked into it, I thought, hold on, that's surely not the only reason. Uh, and you can start to think, okay, yes, maybe molecular component could be, could be an important factor. Maybe there's a neuromuscular factor. Maybe there's differences in training. I'm sure, like, if you had uh, one person that was training strength six times a week, And then one person that was training strength three times a week and then endurance three times a week, you know, they might think, oh, you're doing endurance training. That's why you might not be improving in strength as much as the other guy that's doing strength training six times a week. But they seem to be forgetting that the other guy is doing double the amount of strength work as the other guy. So surely time given towards that type of training is going to influence it. So I, the more and more I looked into it, I don't necessarily think I had a hunch, but it seems to be, okay, you've got the molecular side, you've got the fatigue side, you've got the differences in training variables and time management towards certain uh, training different component side. There's so many different things that could be leading to this. So if there is a slight difference between a combined group or a hybrid group versus a strength only group, there could be a number of different factors that contribute to that. So we've got to think about what kind of goals are we going for and then how can we manipulate the training variables to try and minimize that gap as much as possible? Um, so, yeah, that's been the, the exciting side of things, I guess, just seeing that there was more, 
you know, it's multifactorial, like everything is. You go in thinking it's one thing and you're looking for that that uh, gold medal. But uh, it's always multiples of things that get affected in different ways by different things. So, yeah, it's, it's an exciting line of uh, inquiry, definitely. Thinking back to what you said at the beginning of the podcast, uh, the link or maybe the missing link between researchers and coaches, through in the research that you that you went through to to you know to go through all those findings did you did you feel like the interventions that were proposed in those studies were adequate in terms of what you might see in real world training and i don't say that you know arrogantly towards researchers but and obviously i understand that sometimes you need to skew the design of your study so that it's more on the end of the spectrum in the extremes let's say so we can maybe magnify the effect and really pull something out of it but at the same time it <clears throat> it seems like how you organize your training is a big part of whether it's going to work or not and did you find that most of those studies took that into account in their design or not necessarily Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one between trying to control everything as much as possible so you can see the variable that is making the, the difference, if there is, versus, you know, the real world examples. Because if we, like, say we went for a training session, we probably would, uh, and it was a strength one, we'd probably focus on, you know, several different exercises of varying intensity, probably the, the highest intensity at the beginning, and then you're going to have a load of assistance work after that. I'm thinking quite crudely here. Um, But if you look at a lot of the training programs in the interventions, like it could be, um, let's say that first study was, I think it was, what was it again? It was five, it was sets of five on squat and then three tens on like calf raises. And then that's it. And then other studies have looked at like five sets of 10 on leg extensions. And I can understand why they've done that. But it's because they've tried to isolate the muscle, mm. um, which also you know makes sense. But, uh, you know, to transfer that to a full training session is much more difficult, you know, to extrapolate those findings, to make big decisions around training becomes more difficult. So you can have a, you're, you're still kind of using that as a guideline. This may happen. So that's why I'm making this decision. Um, so I don't think the findings are necessarily, all. Oh, you know, they lack ecological validity. We should ignore them. Um, but people should be aware of how they interpret it into their own programming decision making, because... Yeah, th these sessions, training sessions in these studies are, um, yeah, sets of five sets of 10, it could be. And, and that's why a lot of those studies also use either novice or moderately, moderately trained athletes, usually recruited from around the university. It's because if you are a good athlete, you don't want to stop all the other training so you can do that study. Like, no way, that's not going to happen. Um, even when people ask me to do it, and I'm like, I might affect my other training. And I'm not exactly going for, like, gold medals yeah. or anything like that. So you can understand where a lot of some of the findings may have come from purely because of just who they've recruited. Um, yeah, it's, it's a limitation, but it's also, yeah, we just need to be aware. But some studies have looked at and used more highly trained athletes uh, and I, I guess I've lent into those studies a little bit more in terms of what I feel overall is what people should be doing if you, you to develop some principles to uh, guide your hybrid programming those those studies are probably more focused in my thinking I think what were the most surprising facts that you came across while digging into the hybrid training or concurrent training research probably uh actually reading professor Barr's papers and then getting to interview him or in the podcast straight after that was uh that was a brilliant <laughs> that was a brilliant morning uh and the reason being is <clears throat> When we think about these intervention studies, we need to think about what the performance measure that they've looked at. So it could be some form of strength. Maybe it's a 1RM back squat. It could be um, uh, 1RM or some 10RM on the leg extension, something like that. But it's a, it's a performance measure based mm -hmm. on how you perform a particular exercise. Now, if we think about what happens um, in terms of 
the molecular side of the interference effect. Um, if I took a biopsy out of my leg and I stripped it right down to the myofiber um, and looked at it in cell cultures, I might actually find quite a strong molecular interference effect. You know, the idea that we might get <clears throat> the AMPK uh, or the AMP kinase forming some kind of regulatory or inhibition of the mTOR. But as we move away from that to the, the, the actual performance level of the skill, um, we are seeing much less of any type of interference effect. And, you, and then you start to think, well, actually, is it actually measuring what you're describing? It's, it's not, is it? So, like, if you think about someone does an eight-week training program and they improve in their back squat, like, they can improve their back squat through better performing the skill uh, neuromuscularly. Uh, you know, better neuromuscular function, for example. So you might have um, you might have the molecular side of the interference effect actually be quite large, but they've improved their performance through other means. So you're not always necessarily going to be uh, measuring exactly what you think. So if you if you do some form of uh, study over eight weeks, and uh, they they improve in their whatever value or whatever exercise that you've chosen that you're going to have as your strength thing again there's going to be lots of different ways of um how the athlete can improve and to nail that down to some kind of small thing like the molecular side of things i don't think actually paints a whole picture of what goes on even even professor Barr was talking about if i pull out um you know a clump of muscle tissue there's going to be nerve fibers um uh, nerve cells uh, vascular cells 10 other different cells which are all going to act or respond to the stress of training in different ways. Yet we are associating this one type of uh, change or this molecular interference effects and having probably thinking it interferes in performance much more greatly than it actually does. Um, and then you talked about molecular breaks, uh, the idea that the body has a way of, especially when it's under energy stress, it doesn't want to get too big because then it has to provide more energy for a bigger muscle. That's not very efficient for the, for the body. So the body has ways of trying to limit that. And we've got myostatin as well. It's a myokine that tries to reduce the amount of uh, muscle growth that happens. The body's you know, clever and body's probably used to um, being in an energy deficit you know, back in the caveman days when you never know when your next meal is and you've got to cover large distances to hunt food. Like it's muscle tissue is costly. So the body is responded in that way. We're having these mus uh, mus uh, what's it called? molecular breaks. So they, they do exist. And maybe there's a bit of a change with how severe these molecular breaks actually occur because, um, you know, in the last century, food has been very plentiful. So energy resources have been much more readily available. Has that changed how we uh, actually respond uh, in terms of the molecular pathways? Um, possibly, but I've not actually read much about that. So it's definitely an interesting line of inquiry. Um, I guess I read something today that had had that in my head, where they looked, they actually looked at the molecular response through training and different orders around strength training followed by endurance. And mm. if they if they're in an energy deficit, as in they didn't have any food beforehand, there was actually quite a large uh, <laughs> interference effect. But if they were well fed with the necessary um, I guess like amino acids, it was much, much, much less of an effect. Um, I had a question on my mind just before, and now it has completely left my my brain. So I will I will continue. Yes, the molecular side. Can you please uh, give us a brief overview of what AMPK and mTOR mean, just for the maybe those that don't aren't familiar with the acronyms? Cool. Yeah. So. The mTOR is the mechanistic uh, target of rapamycin. So there's a complex one. It's actually a, a complex of proteins which actually come together to be a kinase. And as a kinase, it's an enzyme that tries to create uh, chemical reactions. Uh, and what it does, it, then it sort of populates different phosphate groups to different proteins. And by doing that, the phosphate is negatively charged. Uh, and it adds it to proteins that are usually like neutral charged. Um, so you change the charge of the protein. So all of a sudden you've got these proteins that are some are positive, some are negative, that pushes things away. 
uh, from each other that changes the shape of the protein. And then that in turn leads to uh, how activated uh, different types of proteins are. So with that, the mTOR is the thing that tries to stimulate protein synthesis. And the way we can try and stimulate mTOR is technically by two different ways. Uh, you can either do it through uh, insulin type growth factors. Uh, and that actually has a, a number of, there's like a cascade of different chemical reactions linked to a number of proteins to reach mTOR. So it's kind of, it doesn't take a long time, but does in terms of like molecular time. Um, and then you've got the consumption of amino acids, usually through diet, through protein, that type of thing. They activate mTOR as well. Technically, one activates the um, activator and then one moves the activator to mTOR to activate that. Mm -hmm. So you need both to, to activate mTOR. Resistance training does the exact same thing as the uh, growth factors, except it doesn't go through that cascading different uh, process of all the activating different proteins. It just goes straight to doing its job. So it's much more efficient. So you either need uh, the process of activating mTOR to try and encourage protein synthesis by... Um, either amino acids and IGF growth factors or amino acids and training. Then you've got AMPK, which is the adenosine monophosphate kinase, which kind of acts like the same thing. Um, but this time, the what the kinase does, it tries to um, activate certain proteins to try and, uh, they're the ones that are responsible for generating energy. So AMPK will only activate when it recognizes AMPK being produced. And AMPK being produced is because of ATP is being broken down. And that only happens during exercise. So, yeah, the AMPK will respond to the fact that ADP and AMP uh, increase in the muscle because ATP has been broken down. And the idea behind it is trying to activate these proteins to regenerate energy because it needs more energy because you know endurance exercise is that constant exercise isn't it it constantly requires energy to keep going uh and the idea behind it is that the ampk kinase can actually down regulate certain aspects of the mTOR uh pathway purely because uh it it needs to the body needs activates ampk because it needs to create more energy if the muscle was bigger it would need to create even more energy and the body doesn't want to do that. So it tries to downregulate that. Mm. So that's the kind of overall uh, idea of why there might be that AMPK downregulates mTOR or why endurance exercise tries to downregulate the body's ability to go through protein synthesis. Um, but yeah, it's starting to look like it's much more complex in humans. They, they actually found in rat studies uh, well, where they've taken out the myofibers out of rats, that AMPK can completely shut down mTOR. Mm -hmm. So when doing these studies, they start to think, oh, wait, maybe that actually happens in humans as well. And humans are much more uh, complex than that. Um, uh, for some reasons that I've explained earlier with, you know, all the different cells and, um, you know, genetically, we just respond differently between each other where uh, I guess rats are much more similar. Um, and so there's, you know, more, there's a few papers I sent to you the other day, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, where they're trying to look around, okay, if we change these aspects of training, so comparing, I don't know, moderate intensity endurance exercise versus high intensity endurance exercise, does that change how AMPK regulates uh, mTOR? Uh, and the recent one from Tom Jones up in Northumbria found that the different types of training, so if you had strength training followed by moderate endurance exercise or strength training followed by high intensity endurance exercise, their AMPK slash mTOR responses are different, but there was nothing to suggest that AMPK uh, inhibited mHOR, mTOR in any way different just because you've done endurance uh, or well, in high intensity endurance exercise. So it makes it much more complex and the idea that maybe intensity isn't necessarily a mediator for how much the molecular in interference effect is affecting our training. Yeah, the, well, that's, that was a fascinating dive into the, the molecular side and maybe what's, we need to 
you know, take, take back with us is the importance of having that holistic perspective and not getting bogged down in the, in, in the details, because you can easily get lost in those things. And, and don't get me wrong. It's fascinating. And I, I go down rabbit holes as well. Um, but if you don't come back out to look at the whole picture, it's, you, you get stuck, right? You get stuck mm-hmm. and you get stuck thinking one thing. And at the end of the day, like you said, it might apply to this very, you know, select environment, but then when you blow it out, then it, the effect is, is can hardly be seen anymore. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Or it's something else that might be affecting it. So if we saw a decrease in performance or say, I don't want to say decrease, that's the wrong word. It's more suboptimal. So, you know, if you get like a hybrid uh, training program and they only improved 80% of what the strength only uh, group improved. Uh, and we did that comparison, like with that Tom Jones study, we just said, there might not be uh, the molecular side that might be causing that decrease. It could be the fact that maybe they were just more tired coming from the high intensity exercise. And then if you think about it like that, the ideas around manipulating training variables for hybrid training become very, very similar into what people do for strength and conditioning. Um, it's, you know, you just maximize your, your most important sessions because you need to be more fresh from them. If you worked harder, you need more recovery from them. Uh, the principles start to become very, very similar. There's nothing necessarily outrageous. You might think that if you go way to or place too much emphasis on kind of what I just described, <laughs> to be honest, it could lead you to make some poor training decisions um, just because you're thinking, oh, this might happen. So, like, yeah, calm down. That You know, it might happen in a, at the muscle or the myofibril level, but you probably mm-hmm. won't feel that much of that effect when it comes to actual training. So, If we try and um, come away with some practical ideas around hybrid training, can you lay the foundation for us first without even talking about training itself? What do we need to have in place in our lives? What do athletes need to have in place in their lives if they want to be able to perform at a high level, regardless of whether they want to do hybrid training or, or, or not? For you, what are the intangibles that we need? Because I, I feel like we talk about the training a lot. We don't talk about the underlying aspects and those are going to um, dictate the extent to which the program is going to be successful or, or not to a large extent, at least. Uh, so I feel like it's, it's worth, you know, spending a few minutes on it. What for you are the intangibles that need to be in place for any training program to be successful? Can I start that with a question to you? Because it's more of a reflection. Um, I've I definitely feel I've made the mistake when creating training programs for others in the past where I have not taken into account stress coming from outside of training. Uh, Sport, uh, no, sorry, work is the big one. Um, You know, what time or travel is another big one. Uh, You know, there's a a difference between I've got this amount of time that I can dedicate to uh, training, but outside of that, I'm traveling four hours a day in a car. You know, if you don't take that into account, then you're going to make poor decisions when creating that training program. Mm-hmm. So I guess for me, I want to truly understand what are the out- outside factors I feel are going to create the uh, most negative effects on stress for the athlete mm-hmm. so that I could either make a decision on like discussing with the athlete how we can change their outside life to not affect their training. If that's not possible, then we've got to make changes to the training to accommodate the fact that they've got the stress coming outside. So because of hybrid training, you're likely, if you want to get really good at hybrid training, you're going to have to put in a lot of training (laughs) because you're trying to get better at two different disciplines. So that requires a lot of training. Um, If you're adding that training on top of a load of stress from outside of the training, it's not going to work. Um, I, I see it quite common with, athletes that try and maintain a certain level of intensity and volume of training uh, and then they have children and it's like (laughs) that initial six months after having children where they they just can't do it they pick up niggly injuries and it's just because they're not recovering as much outside of of their training so I, I try and get that right first just define that base level 
And then once that happens, I just try and improve very, very slowly. So even looking back to some of the old uh, interference effect type intervention studies, and they're like, well, in the initial six weeks, we improve strength at the same rate as the strength only. My argument is, why would you want to? You're training two different things. You want that to be a very shallower gradient, but you want it to be consistent over a very long period of time. So all this idea of, oh, you know, you're training strength and endurance, you're not going to, you're losing gains. I was like, well, I don't actually care because as long as I'm improving consistently and slowly over a long period of time, then I'm going to be successful. I have a chance for my body to get used to the stress of dealing with all these different types of training stresses and probably outside stress that the body adapts so I can then very slowly build on that. So I think that's kind of a principle for any sport, but I think it's more important for hybrid training because you're trying to do uh, lots of different things at once. Especially, it's especially hard in the world of, in our world of instant gratification, trying to tell people that it's going to take some time. You need to be consistent. Uh, what you just said there is, I think, you know, probably, and it's funny because it's, it's such a macro thing that we don't even, we obviously it, it's part of the training, but it's also part of the big picture of, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not about the three or four perfect weeks of training. It's about, and, and, mm-hmm. and you, and you see that in any elite sport, it's about weeks and months and years of uninterrupted practice uh, with, you know, sound structure and, you know, managing stress and recovery and allowing yourself to keep getting better and better month after month. And so I like your idea of, you know, being, being almost slower than you could be. I think that's a, that's a, that's a good, that's a good approach to have. Um, and like you said, having children is, is a huge challenge when it comes, especially sleep. I mean, uh, I personally know that if I don't sleep well, I, I'm useless. I feel like I'm okay, but I'm not, I'm, I'm really useless. My back starts to hurt. Thoughts are not the, the same. And do, do you have any good strategies that you try to implement around sleep habits so that people can get the most out of this, even if they don't get, you know, as much as they, they should, uh, because, because children, because other reasons, intangibles, um, what, what are the few things that we should do or could do around sleep to just make sure we check as many boxes as we can on that front? At the moment, I think this is a, an area I'm still developing because I want to find uh, a better way of linking just general wellness to or trying to understand general wellness whether that's through hrv uh i want to is it what's his name alton altony marco altini yeah 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 so i only really just got into his work so it's an area that great stuff by the way yeah yeah really trying to yeah there's there's a lot straight away there's there's, it's it's great (laughs) but there's a lot to 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 look into and maybe it's because i've been focusing a lot on like gordo burns work on Twitter, he, he links it up together. And then so like, oh, this is, I obviously I knew and have used HRV um, monitoring in, in the past, but I feel this looks like a better system to get involved with. So I, I, I need to look into that. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find different ways of getting some kind of understanding of whether it be RPE in terms of mood, uh, hours slept if i can get a load of information daily whether it seems a bit arbitrary on its own like hours slept i want to get this data so it can tell a story Mm. i think people can be quite reactionary to like oh you've seen a dip right we need to make a training decision now to because otherwise if this carries on we're in trouble Uh, a lot of the time i just want to try and understand how this person uh, function over a long period of time so that when it does happen in the in in the future I can make a better informed decision because I know how they respond to it uh, I think I had this I had this discussion with the powerlifting coach Mike Touchure uh, and he uses like um, bar velocity mm. uh, RPE or R, you know reps and reserve type training mm. um, we, we looked at the differences between you know you might have an athlete who over six weeks going for doubles on an RPE of eight actually don't make any changes. But then suddenly towards the end of the block, seven and eight, they just see this big 
exponential increase where you'll have another athlete who will exponentially increase their lows used still keeping to an rpa or a double at an rpa eight but then plateau so the block for both of them is the same length but they respond very differently yeah. but you'd only know that if you know the athlete by getting that information over a long period of time so yeah in terms of, i want to try and develop and probably something I need to look into a little bit more because I haven't fully decided what I think is worthwhile yet. Um, but definitely find some form of wellness monitoring where whether it's just like five numbers a day consistently over a long period of time to get a story of that athlete. And then I think we can make better training decisions um, going forward because of that. Yeah, I think Marco's app is great. Uh, HRV for training. I'm, I'm not affiliated with it, but I, I do use it uh, daily. I stopped for a couple months, but I, I picked it back up again. And like you said, just having the same numbers every day in the same, uh, you know, framework, it's, it's very interesting. First and foremost, I would say to just learn how to listen to yourself a little bit better. And I think uh, diverging a bit here, but I think that's what the Norwegians have done really well uh, in triathlon with Olaf Alexander and, and Christian and uh, Gustav and the other guys. Mm. Um, they've, they've used technology to learn to fine tune their perception. And if we can use those tools as that, as tools to improve that aspect, then we're, we're just going to be better at making our own decisions, whether we have the tech or not. Right. Mm. I think, like you said, it's a problem when the tech becomes a crutch and you rely on it. And if you don't have, and, and then you, and then you base everything on it. Um, now it's one, it's one aspect, but the, the RP is, it's interesting. You bring that up. I, I find myself using this more and more as much as I love, I love all the tools that I have to, for testing, for measuring, the more I move forward, the, the, I wouldn't say the less I use them, but the more importance I assign to, uh, RPE and, you know, differentiating RP global, uh, respiratory muscular in the legs mm. on, a, on a cycling effort for example and already already those numbers give you such a great story of of how uh of how different intensities affect a given athlete and how that might change over time and mm. one might say yeah but your heart rate was the same at the power output so there's no progress well yeah if the if you went down one or two points on the rp scale that that's progress whether you know something underneath change or not um so I, I definitely think RP is is very important and shouldn't be overlooked. Back to my line of questioning on, um, you know, we we talked a little bit about the intangibles. Managing stress was the big one that you brought forward, which I think is, well, again, training is stress, right? Zebras don't get ulcers, and uh, you need to count tr the training as a stress and everything else as a stress as well, and make sure that the total load of stress does not exceed the capacity of the person to recover from it. Um, let's talk about training now. So what are the overarching principles of hybrid training that you've been able to extract from all the work you've done so far? On top of thinking more long-term and progressing very slowly, um, I guess the main other one, and I'm thinking very basic here, because like you, what you just described, how you, you're leaning towards RPE, but you've got all this testing as well, and they kind of help each other. but um, I'd love to like find like different levels. Like you've got a level where you've got like no tech, some tech, a lot of tech. Yeah. And you kind of work your way through it um, because it's, it's like learning statistics, but doing the mathematics and not relying on the, uh, you have an appreciation of everything when you yeah. do it, when you haven't got anything, um, which is quite important for, I think quite important for RPE because RPE can be reflective or it be prescriptive, can't it? And it's quite a skill to learn how the, you use each one differently. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess the main one that I've always thought of to go along with the more long term thinking of going slowly is around developing the um, program of the week. Mm -hmm. And that comes from around, you know, what is the most important sessions that require uh, freshness and fatigue? And then maybe based on some of the research literature, we can actually provide the right level of recovery after it or before it to make sure that we are enhancing the training response that we get from it. So, <clears throat> for example, 
one of the key studies that made me think of this was done by Coffey and Hawley, where they had elite powerlifters and they had elite cyclists. But the powerlifters never did any aerobic training and the cyclists never did any strength training. So they were all very new to that type of training stress. So what they did was they got both groups to do an endurance session and then they got both groups to do a strength session. And then they measured the molecular response um, to that. And what they found is when the strength lot did the strength session, mTOR was really low. But AMPK, the new stimulus, was super high. Similarly, the elite training uh, cyclists, when they did the cycling workout, AMPK was pretty low, whereas mTOR shot through the roof. So clearly, if the stimulus is novel to that person, then they have a very large molecular response. And through training or repeated bouts, you become less sensitized to that training response. Yeah, dim so, diminishing, diminishing returns, accommodation. Diminishing yeah. returns. Yeah. So that made me think, if you're doing a training week, you're going to have some sessions which are harder and then some sessions which are uh, lower in intensity. The, the focus might be more on, I don't know, assistance work, skill work, whatever it might be. Because we know that if we trained at 100% intensity all the time, that's going to lead to problems. What do you mean, Phil? We can't do... <laughs> Seven <laughs> workouts a week. You all might out, be able to. Then... <laughs> well, I've, got two, well, I've got two high intensity training sessions, one after the other. I'm probably broken for about two weeks. I need to go on holiday. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, so when you've got that particular, like, okay, this is the session that I know is going to create the most of a, a, a a, either a molecular response or a neuromuscular response through like acute fatigue. I know I want to make sure that that session is protected. So if my next session after that is, I don't know, say that session's in the morning, I probably, if I was going to train again in the evening, I would make sure that that session was uh, lower in intensity and probably in a modality I was very accustomed to. So if it was strength training um, for a strength biased athlete, they're probably going to recover better um, if they had a strength session after that. Whereas a, an endurance session might be create greater fatigue, which may inhibit the recovery from that big session that they had earlier today. Uh, similarly, or conversely, I think it's probably the better thing. If it was a um, if it was an endurance athlete. You could probably put cycling in the evening. It probably wouldn't have that response. It probably wouldn't interrupt their recovery that much uh, from that. So you could probably have that there. And then you've got other things which might require longer recovery times. So there's a great paper. I'll have to send it to you after this by Rubinio. Mm -hmm. It did it in um, uh, sevens players. Nice. Uh, and uh, they looked at the recovery time post a session to see how quickly they recovered. So they had max strength, I think in like a half squat, back, uh, bench press, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then they also looked at that recovery on uh, leg extension strength, but also leg strength, extension strength at different speeds. Mm -hmm. So what they found was that when it came to max strength, uh, usually they were recovered by around six hours. They actually measured directly after the session, six hours later and 24 hours later. Yeah. But when it was max strength, they're normally relatively recovered by six hours. Whereas the faster movements um, with the leg extension, it was still compromised six hours later. So clearly there is like, okay, for max strength stuff, you probably recover uh, a bit more quickly. But if you did something that requires uh, greater velocity of muscle shortening, uh, mm. you know, those fast twitch fibers that fatigue easy, maybe they take longer to recover. So instead of having a session that evening, you might need to make sure that session's the next day because it needs that extra time to recover from the, 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 I don't know, the intense weightlifting session you did that morning. So it's just to, trying to understand, okay, make those intense sessions uh, a priority. And then if they have, if you're training something like, I don't know, speed of movement, uh, that requires a lot of recovery, just make sure that you have more recovery. Um, whereas other things like strength, you may be able to recover faster from, so then you could probably 
reorder your training sessions a bit more densely mm. from that. So, yeah, those are kind of like the main things uh, in terms of like we order, we organize in the week. And again, they're not too much different from like basic strength and conditioning principles. It's just having an understanding that maybe um, certain things require more recovery than others because they are more susceptible to the interference effect. Um, an interesting thing, actually, which is, is still relevant, um, in terms of the molecular response, the mTOR pathway can remain active after the strength training for up to 18 hours. So that's a long time that that stays active for protein synthesis. Whereas the AMPK pathway um, can actually decrease back down to baseline levels pretty quickly, uh, which kind of makes sense. The AMPK pathway is only activated if it recognizes an increase in ADP and AMPK in the, in the muscle. As soon as you stop exercising, ATP is not broken down, so you're not getting AMPK and ADP. So it's not needed to be um, elevated. So there's a, there's a big difference there. So if you've got something where, I don't know, your main focus is muscle hypertrophy, you know that the AMT, AM, mTOR pathway is elevated for a long time after it, maybe just try and avoid other types of training to not disrupt it because that is your main focus. Mm. Um, so yeah, see, it's just identifying based on your goals, what are the hot sessions for you? And then just making sure that the recovery time is uh, appropriate so that it's not disrupted. One thing you mentioned that I've been leaning into a lot more recently is <clears throat> just describing the predispositions of the athlete, like the profile of the athlete themselves on a very basic endurance to powerful kind of spectrum. And obviously then we can talk about, you know, fiber distribution and all those things. But intrinsically, we know, you know, we have someone in front of us or two athletes and we can usually make them apart on that spectrum and say, oh, he's more here, he's more there, he's more in the middle. And that usually already gives you a lot of ideas as to, okay, what do they need to work? You know, I think about CrossFit athletes that I work with a lot these days. And the, the best of the best are a blend of the two, obviously, right? And they're very good in both, uh, but they're not necessarily skewed one way or another. And that's really, at this point, a factor of how the sport is being conducted and manifested in competition which could totally change if, I don't know, somebody with a, a triathlon background comes and starts writing, you know, games workouts mm -hmm. that might skew the, the scale a little bit to the endurance side. Uh, but in general, if you're just trying to, you know, bring that athlete closer to the middle and obviously higher on the scale of performance, uh, it's usually going to be a, a decent strategy to begin with. Uh, do you find that? with the people that you work with. And obviously it depends on the goal. Cause I guess hybrid training is a very, very broad topic and th there can be very different challenges within that scope. Um, do you, do you, do you think about, you know, training and organizing training in those terms as well on, on some level? Yeah, I, I guess if the main aim is to improve two different things, you kind of want to be in that middle sweet spot, which is people think, Oh, you know, you just prioritize one more than the other. I don't think it's as easy as that because usually if they've come from a strength background, they prefer that. So they enjoy training more in that way. Uh, so they train with more intent for that, that type of mm. domain of sport, uh, which affects their um, endurance training. Um, Cause if you just went full the other way, you know, the ego of, Oh, my, my strength training is going to be affected, which it will, because you're doing much less of it. And, and this isn't me saying, Oh, there's some big interference effect. You're probably doing less of it. Mm. Um, so I think, I think it's quite different, uh, you know, it's a tricky thing to do. I do like the idea of, you know, almost like having two little dials. So you've got your strength dial, you've got your endurance dial, and then you sort of like turn one down, the other one slightly up. Um, and because of that, I feel that because you're still near that 50% point, which might be like the sweet spot you want to get to, um, you can kind of improve in one slowly while not reducing performance in the other. So where you, you go like 60, 40, mm -hmm. um, you know, 50, 50 is, is your base. You may bias one uh, based on the, uh, you know, you might have an event coming up. You might have certain goals that you have because you notice know certain weaknesses. So you might have some um, slight focus more on the other, um, but without going too far one way, I think that is better at allowing the 
athlete getting used to dealing with both stresses coming at them at once. Um, I think that's a skill uh, that and a physical capacity skill that needs to be developed um, so that you can build on it. And if you're chopping and changing between the two too much, I don't think you give that athlete the opportunity to get used to that type of constant stress of both strength and endurance acting at the same time. So if we go back to that Coffey and Hawley study, you know, um, you know, I want, they're obviously clearly like 100% one way and 0% the other. And I do want to move them towards the 50% one. Um, but, um, you know, that, that takes time and it takes time to get used to the new stimulus of one of the training domains, so either strength and endurance, but then it's also takes time to get used to having them come at you at the same time. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So little changes I think are, much better i always like the idea of what my base is and then i build on that base and that base is usually that 50 percent. and by you building it you 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 tweak your dial slightly so that it's going one way or the other back and forth uh and ultimately if you zoom out over a year the the average is like 50 50 so yeah especially considering that maintenance doesn't require nearly as much volume and intensity as, as you know developing a quality so that's mm. something we can use to our advantage and i really like your perspective of patience in everything that you put forward um that's another thing that i find myself doing now is just hey we got to run through the training we got to be consistent we got to get the feedback and then we have to see how it works because like you said two two going back to something you said earlier two athletes same training block very different responses and we need to consider that in, in is he, talking specifically here about, you know, programming and planning for, for different athletes. We need to get to know how they react, how they tolerate the volume, the intensity, the different modalities. And that will give us a lot of clues as to what to do next uh, versus just mm -hmm. writing stuff. The, the, the more advanced, the, the more what I write down is just a, an, an informed guess, right? It's an educated guess. But then it's completely subject to interpretation and what we're going to do with it, you know, next week or, or, or the next block, because it might not work at all. We might have to just completely review it versus um, just, you know, thinking of something and then and then putting it down. Uh, Phil, I have. Go, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say patience is linked to uh, maintaining goals over a long period of time as well. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think a lot of the problems that I've definitely personally have had in the past. Uh, and what I see is that people are constantly training, even though they're still hybrid, they're changing their goals. It's like, okay, now I'm going to do weightlifting, but now I'm going to focus purely on powerlifting. Oh, I'm going to go for a, a, an Ironman here, but no, 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 actually I changed my mind. I'm just going to do running. You know, then you can't develop that consistency because the goal is constantly moving. Even though you're still training hybrid, you know, you've got to spend a lot of time in those training modalities to develop a level of efficiency. Mm. Uh, and if you're chopping and changing your direction, even if it's still hybrid, it's, you know, it's difficult to do that. And probably one of the, the difficult things of being very good at CrossFit, because you've got to put in a lot of training because there's so many different skill sets that you need to be master of. And to be truly efficient at all of them, like you need to be training, <laughs> you know, 24 seven, but you obviously can't. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's difficult. I'd, you know, just pick where you want to, which, you know, try and be consistent with your goals is probably the best thing I would suggest. Mm. Let's uh, take that one in mind in terms of, you know, being patient, not switching goals every two minutes. What other no-nos uh, do you see or would you, you know, urge people to, to think about and try to avoid if they want to maximize their hybrid training? Uh, yeah. My no-no is it's linked to progressing slowly, actually. So I remember a while back, I think it was on another podcast, the Oxidative Potential podcast. I listened to, he had an episode with Evan. Mm -hmm. Obviously Evan was on, um, has been on both our podcasts. A fountain of knowledge, isn't he? And Indeed. he talked about progressive overload being your ability to tolerate more stress, not the fact that you're adding more load each week. And that's so key. I actually I, wrote I actually wrote this quote down. Yes. <laughs> I know exactly the one that you that you yeah. mentioned. It's it was brilliant. And I yeah, I remember writing it down. And I think people don't follow that. And it leads them to mm -hmm. what I call the two-week problem, is because <laughs> they 
have their first week at too high of an intensity, just because they're relatively fresh because it's a new training block, they progress too fast into week two. And the issue of progressing too fast into week two means they're probably going to have a problem come week seven, eight. You know, the, 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 the pain or the, the bad payoff from progressing too early in your training block mm. is that the issue is going to arise later on in the training block. And, you know, even though you can't, uh, I'm going to describe this, a lot of the time people don't notice it because they say they increase their, their loads by 2.5 kilos that week. It's like, well, I can do it. It's like, yeah, you, you probably have progressively overloaded, but you don't know because you keep adding more stuff on. How do you mm. really, the best way to show you've progressively overloaded is if you do the same training session, uh, training week in week two as week one, and it feels much easier. That's the best way to show it. Um, so this is why I think, you know, we need to progress slowly because, you know, it gives you opportunity to actually feel like, oh, I'm actually adapting to all of this training stress because everything's feeling easier. If you're constantly increasing the intensity and in whatever you're doing, uh, right, I'll just add five five kilometers on your runs this week. Like you're never going to get to that point. And it always ends in niggles eight weeks later, never at the early stages. Um, yeah, that's that's a great one. Trying to repeating training and then you can actually see if you're improving or not like you said that you know mm. shiny object syndrome and instant gratification of always something new always variation it's it's that's just a killer to try and actually spot if you're doing better or not yeah. um so it, it that, that was a that was a great point especially if we're using rpe like us yeah like uh if you're using it as yeah. you know reflective tool you're constantly changing it you're never getting inconsistency of of how the rpe is improving um because really it should go down. Um, but if you're constantly changing it, you're never going to see that because you've got no comparison. Yeah. Phil, thank you so much for coming on the show. And thank you for having me. That was a lot of fun. Um, and I urge everybody to go check out your podcast. Tell us where we can find your podcast, Phil. Yeah, if you follow at the Progress Theory on Instagram, that's probably my main media platform to um, share stuff. Ah, there it is. There's the, yeah, the website is www.progresstheory.com. Um, but uh, it's available on like Apple Podcasts, um, Spotify, all of that. Stuff. And you can see that we've had loads and loads of great guests. Um, really, I am standing on the shoulders of these giants, to be honest. And I, I don't mean that in a very sort of cliche way. Like uh, a lot of my knowledge has come from reading it, talking to these a lot and then further reading because they just give me so many more questions. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, please check out uh, their great conversations. Yeah, well, uh, I really appreciate your process and, and all the work that you're doing. And again, thanks for coming on the show. It was a lot of fun. And uh, I'm sure we'll get to catch up again and continue exchanging, whether it's, you know, live on a platform or via email uh, exchanging papers. So thanks again for your time, man. That was a lot of fun. Uh, thank you. I'll send those papers your way and we'll keep this going.